part of what I want to cover tonight in anxiety and fear and worry, we're going to work through, I'm just going to work through this booklet here with you, but we're going to be in some text tonight, so make sure you have your Bibles out. Um, and I, will, I want to hear from you what text you use whenever you're battling fear and anxiety as well once we get through. But out of all seriousness, how many of you honestly would say that you struggle? It's a personal struggle of yours if you're willing to share. You don't have to share the struggle, but just do you struggle with fear, worry, or anxiety regularly? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, some of us, sometimes, some others, you know. We all have different areas in, in, our, in our walks where we're um, stronger and weaker. And so for some, so about half of you at least raised your hands there. So right away, we should know that for half of us, this is a real big deal. For the other half, the times that we do struggle, this is a big deal. And we want to be able to know how to encourage one another as well, because part of this is you're supposed to encourage one another. So this little booklet, I'm going to kind of read through and comment as we go. You know the feeling, the same thoughts keep spinning around and around in your mind. You feel like a frenzied juggler. Your worries, your problems, your fears whirl around in your head like so many china plates. And you feel afraid, preoccupied, obsessed. You're afraid that if you lose focus for even one second, your whole life will come crashing down. Anyone feel that way a little bit sometimes? You have plenty of company. Anxiety affects everyone. No one escapes it. In a worrisome world, we all feel anxious sometimes. You might not feel, you may, might not feel all of the unpleasant effects or extreme anxiety or the churning stomach or the fluttery feelings or the cold hands and everything else all the time, but it does happen. God made you, so he knows all about your anxious thoughts. He knows the troubles you face. He knows that everyone experiences anxiety. So his word, the Bible, is filled with many good and useful and true things that are meant to help you in your struggle with worry and fear. Let me start off. What verses or passages do you go to, since half of you really struggle with it and the other half struggle with it some, what scripture... And don't open your Bible. Yeah, that's right. I said it. What scripture have you memorized to help you battle this? The Lord is your shepherd. It goes on. So why is why is Psalm twenty three? Why is that a good one? What things in Psalm 23 are helpful for worries and anxiety? What are some things there that you hear? Or why do you, why do you use Psalm 23? What about it? Uh, it's always helped me. Mm -hmm. times. I, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right. I mean, that's yeah. right there. What is it? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He lies, leads me beside raging waters. Still waters. Still waters. I'm sorry, I have a different translation than you. <laughs> Right. You know, right. Out of fear, no evil. fear no evil. Right. So, if you don't have Psalm 23 memorized, might be a good one to use. Or maybe you do have it, but you've never thought about using it with worry or something. Well, that's a great one right there. Okay. What are some others? Uh huh. May the peace of God surpasses all understanding in your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Okay, good. So, that's something that you'll. Pull out when you're in the middle of fear and anxiety. Okay? And that's talking about peace. Right, what's the opposite of, of, of worry and anxiety? What would be the opposite of worry and peace? Yeah, tranquility, peace, right? What else? What are some other ones you guys have? Uh huh, that's Rachel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for your God goes with you. Okay, out of Joshua, right? Yeah. Good. So your God's with you, He goes with you. So be, don't, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Be still and know that I am God. Okay. Yeah. I don't have the whole thing. Yeah. Did you get that part? But that's an easy Yeah. It's a good phrase. Okay. I do very um, loose translation. That's fine. Memorization. Okay. <laughs> um, um, who, by worrying, can add a single day to your life? Right. That's all I've got. Right? <laughs> well, we all kind of know where you're going with that. Yeah. 
Yeah, make yeah, make your make your words known and heard. Yeah, good, good. Uh huh. Justin. Yeah, I can't remember it either. But right. I think what you said is, I feel like it's from Matthew. Yeah, yeah, Matthew. Yeah, the first one's from Matthew. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think the next one will be out of Philippians um, four. Four. Yeah. Right. So, so one thing is, let me ask you this: How many? So, just to be honest, how many times when you worry or anxious? I mean, we have our phones, sure, but how many of you have your Bibles like ready in that moment right there for okay, worry? Okay, make it right. We a lot of times we don't, and even though they're on our phones, sometimes we don't even think about going back. I don't go. You know what? Let me go to my phone and go to the worry tab and go and look at some verses. So, I think an encouragement would be, you know, not only. Some of these that you've mentioned, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit more, but um, there are others in there, and it would be really good for us to memorize them. And then here's the other thing. I'm right there with you. Like sometimes you start quoting a verse, you're like, I want to get close, right? But if the word, if the scriptures are the word of God, God breathed, and we believe that there's power in that, that the Spirit uses it, then we want to get as close to what it actually says as we can. Does that, does that make sense? Now, I think we all do that, and so that's part of the process. You kind of, you generally know it, and then it gets more and more in your brain, and then eventually you kind of know it better. But just so you know, most of us, I don't know, maybe you guys are different, but at least for me, if I don't work on scripture memorization, a lot of times it just doesn't come. I get more general ideas, or if it's one that I've heard over and over again, then okay, maybe that'll stick in. But if I really want to add more, to my brain, as far as scripture memory, it's, it's, it, you have, it's work. you got to work at it. And so making sure that you go, okay, if I'm one that I really struggle with anxiety or fear, or I know I'm around people all the time who do, right? Then have those ready to go, because what would be more powerful than speaking the word of God, a scripture that's going about that, to somebody who's trying, you know, oh, somebody's at work and they just got bad news and they're freaking out, and you just go, hey, can I just, can I just share a passage with you? And you may work in, a, in an environment where you can't put out, pull out a Bible, right? Not, maybe you're not allowed to, or there's not, you know, not uh, able to do that. And so you can just speak it to them, right? There. Good. Any other passages? Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self control. Love and self-control. Good. That, yeah. So not fear. So you don't, you're not, the Lord didn't give you a spirit of fear, right? Okay, good. Okay. And uh, I just uh, turn on Psalms podcasts and listen to one psalm after another. And to me, that's very comforting. And uh, it just reminds you to keep praising the Lord. Good. Uh, and then Jim always says to me, well, who did you pray for when you couldn't sleep? He always reminds me, when you can't sleep at night, we should be praying for somebody. Yeah, that's a good word, right? If you're not sleeping, be praying for people. And then the accountability there, asking. Glad Heather doesn't ask me that. Who'd you pray for? I'd be like... I, I prayed over ice cream in the middle of the night. Right? Now that's good. That's good. Notice that Ms. Marcy is saying there's scripture, right? The, the first song, you know, talking about waiting on the Lord, that was from a psalm, but it's talking about waiting on his word, right? His word in particular, for the spirit to use his word in us when we are struggling, when things are um, scary or overwhelming. Any others? Okay. So Ephesians 6, the, the armor of God, and making sure that you really have, you know, memorized that, and you're actually, you know, thinking on that, right? You're actually going through the steps there. Yeah, good, good, yeah. Uh-huh. First James, consider joy as you face challenges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James chapter 1, right? Consider it all joy, brothers, right? When you face these various trials, you're like, <laughs> all joy, James, you're a psychopath, buddy. <laughs> But it's the strengthening of your faith. That's what he's doing through it, right? So the word is telling you you should consider this joy because most of the time when the hard times come, we don't go, yes. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's a trial. Lord, you're going to do something great with it. Normally we're like, oh, no, not again, right? Isaiah 26, maybe. Yeah, I think it's 26. Yeah, that's good. Begin by asking yourself this question. Would you want to live your entire life with no anxiety? Sure, that would be nice, right? Before you quickly and enthusiastically say yes, think for a moment. 
Isn't the opposite of anxiety being inert, indifferent to the world around you? If you really want to be numb, if you will, to the world around you, then you would want to use drugs, medication, or other things. If you really didn't have any anxiety or anything around you, or you want to just kind of never have that, you can't live in this world very long, can you? Everything around us brings sadness, perhaps, worry, fear, things of that nature. You would have to stop caring. You'd have to just be numb, as we talk about it, right? Just be numb to everything. Have you ever gotten there? Have you ever gotten to where you either were, just you just got to a point to where you became numb, or that you desired to be numb? You wish that you could be numb to the, the, the world around you and stuff going on, so you didn't feel? Sometimes that happens, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> but what would you be missing? Anxiety, when you get to the bottom of it, is a God-given capacity for knowing that something bad is going on in your world. Think about that. Anxiety, when you get to the bottom of it, is a God-given capacity for knowing that something bad is going on in your world, either in the past, the present, or the future. And this, in itself, is not necessarily negative. There's a right kind of anxiety that leads us to express loving concern for others in the midst of their trouble and draws us to take refuge in God when we are in trouble. What would, what would, what would a right example, would you say, of something's going on and you have, again, that first step of anxiety or concern, we'll use kind of more of that phrasing for now, in a situation, it's okay that you're concerned about something. What, what's an example? About your weakness and sin. Okay. Lord, I'm concerned about my weakness and sin. Okay. The way I look at the world, I'm concerned about the flesh looking at all my and so you're rescuing Okay. But very concerned is what drives you in the other direction. Right. You be yeah, you should be concerned about that, so it drives you the other direction. Good, what else? What else are some concern? Health of a family member. Family member gets very sick. It's COVID, right? They're they're very sick. I mean, if you had no feelings whatsoever about that, that would be a little strange. I mean, that God has made us to have feelings, and there should be some, some concern to a, a, a degree, right? I think the question is, what do we do with it? And that's what we'll kind of get to. Other thoughts? Uh-huh. Two uh, 16-year-old girls going out and driving. <laughs> sure. Two 16. Yes, to 16-year-olds driving. Back there, anything? No, we were just agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> just agree. Yeah, Mr. Phil Parker. Like spiritual condition, family members. Spiritual condition, yeah. <laughs> if you're kind of like, eh, whatever, that wouldn't be good. You, you should be concerned, right? There should be a concern. Think of it this way. Anxiety is like a red light flashing on your car's dashboard. When the check engine light goes on, you know something is wrong with your car. You don't exa- know exactly what's wrong. But you do know that it's time to visit the mechanic, or call Jamie McCain. <laughs> would you want to drive without those lights to warn you of an engine problem? Think about that for a minute. Would, I mean, would that be a great thing, just nothing to tell you that something's wrong? No, that, that's, it's a grace from the Lord. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. The same is true with your anxiety. It is, a warning, it is warning you about trouble in your world and trouble in your heart. God has hardwired us to be aware of trouble. If you don't feel intense concern from time to time, you are ignoring real trouble. So we don't want to aim to numb ourselves to, to those things. We want to be aware of them. So there are good reasons to be anxious. We named some of those already. How about just death itself? Be anxious about dying, perhaps, or others dying. For some, that would be a concern, right? For others, but for yourself, I, I have no fear about going to heaven. That's good. We should we should want to definitely go to heaven. I think many people are afraid of the vehicle of death. Like, yeah. like if I know, like it's just like I'm going to close my eyes and I'm done. Like, and there's nothing else. I'm okay. But then if it's like, well, but how's it going to happen? I mean, I think right now there are. I mean, and maybe some of you have experienced this, so I want to be as sensitive as I can when I say this, but fearful 
of dying of COVID or dying alone in the hospital where nobody can get to you like we were praying about, where your family can't be with you. That's scary. I would, I mean, I'm just, uh, that's terrible. Like, I don't, oh man. It could be too the concern of what you're leaving behind. Right. How you're, you're ready to go be with Jesus, but what, yes. yeah, yeah. Your family members. Your family members you're leaving behind. Sure, Miss Boyd. Right. And my mom's idea of how she wanted to die was not a season of suffering. She wanted to be an extremely healthy person. Right. She really struggled with the fact that right. she was going through a season right. of suffering. You know? And I'll tell you this. I have seen more Christians struggle with their faith when it comes to suffering of either themselves or suffering of their loved ones or death of loved ones especially if you lose young ones, that it just crumbles our faith sometimes. And it, I, I would put out there that it may be that we weren't thinking rightly about these things, and then maybe we didn't have our hearts and minds prepared for that by having scriptures and having people around us, and then nobody coming alongside of us and, and helping us walk through that very well. And so many times that's when you'll hear, turning your back on God, walking away from the church. And when you, when you probe into that many times, uh, there's usually something that's happened with a death of some sort. Even those who would even claim to be um, atheists and things, many times when you get to the heart of what happened, it's not a logical argument to why they don't believe in God. Something happened within their life. And they said, that kind of God can't be real. Because something happened. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Yeah, Tim? When I lost Debbie, I was, if it wasn't for my church met, with my church family, right. with my church family, I would have never made it. Right. Because yeah. I got very angry for a while. Right. And that's, that's part of what I'm talking about. So, praise God for the church family loving and coming alongside of you through that season. And that's, again, reinforcing truth and showing the love of Christ and reminding you of what is true and what is right. So death would be one. Relationships ending. Relationships. Do, do any of your relationships cause you anxiety? <laughs> There's no people in my life that cause any stress at all. Never. Lack of money. I mean, finances for, for many people really do are, are stressful, right? If it, Man, you hit a season where... Inflation happens. I mean, I know that would never happen around here, but, you know, if things go up and, and, you, and all of a sudden you lose your job and you're wondering how you're going to pay bills, there's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes in. What's that? Stocks go down. Stocks go down. You go, you click and you go, whoa. All you see is red. There's some trouble. Oh, did I scare him? Sorry, buddy. The list could go on and on, right? There's, there's a lot of things that we would say bring on anxiety. One of the things that is important, though, is here's what it's, he says here. How does anxiety misfire? First, we overreact, overreact to real trouble. Second, we become upset about things that ought not to trouble us. In both cases, our bad anxiety reactions reveals what's going on in our hearts. So there are times to have legit concerns or anxiety, but when there's a misfire happening, what he's saying there is, that means we've overreacted to a real, real troubling situation. We're not thinking biblically about it. Or we become upset about things that we shouldn't be troubled about. Just Not just kind of overreacting, but we're just wasting our time on that thing. So in every situation where you feel sinfully anxious, not just anxious, but sinfully anxious, you believe something is threatening your world. Your world feels out of control. You are afraid of something bad, that something bad might happen. You are trying to control your world to keep the bad thing from taking place. Okay? So if you want to know what makes you anxious in your brains, I want you to think for a second. Don't say it out loud. Finish this sentence. I need blank. I need. What do you need? If you were to think for a moment. I need Fill in the blank. 
Another statement that may reveal these anxieties in your heart, I want blank. I want blank. Whatever you're putting in there could very well be something that is bringing anxiety into your life. How about this one? I don't want fill in the blank. I don't want my family member to die. You shouldn't want that anyway, but do you overreact to that? I don't want my football team to lose. I'm not going to put that in the you're overreacting category. I'm going to put that in the second category that you shouldn't be that upset about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll leave it right there for you. To where it creates. Not that you can't be like, oh man, that's my, you know, darn. All right, time to move on. Yeah. But if you can't move on, then how long? We'll have a counseling session about that. A day. A day, a week. I mean, the question then, yeah, it just really becomes, is that what's always on your mind? If that's just, So, anyway. <laughs> Whatever you fill the blank with, the love of something, your good health, the good health of someone you love, money, a certain job, when you don't get it, you can easily panic. Miss Rachel was working hard to get her license to be able to do this. If it would have been a no, that probably would have been a challenge at least for you, Right? Yes. Very stressful. Very stressful. Right? The things you get that you don't want also make you anxious. They feel wrong, evil, bad. You don't want them. Instead, you want their opposite. Imagine you are facing real trouble. Your child has been diagnosed, diagnosed with a progressive incurable disease. You don't want your child to be ill. You do want your child to live a long, healthy, and full life. You should be concerned But what do you do with your concern? Do you express genuine love for your child? Do you learn an even deeper dependence on God? Or do you erase God and become full of fear, worry, grumbling, and bitterness? Which way do you go? Huh? Or is it all the above in those, right? It's not usually like a one-time transaction. Oh, my child's sick. Now I'm worried. And now I'm done with that. Okay, great. It's not how it works, does it? How, do you, how you deal with your anxiety in both of these situations will review your heart. Oh, here's the other situation, sorry. Now picture yourself in a situation where there isn't real trouble, but you are still anxious. You are going to a party where you don't know anyone. You don't want to be excluded, criticized, ignored, or rejected. But what do you want? You want approval? You want to be a part of the in crowd? You want to matter? You want someone to notice you? You shouldn't be concerned, but you are. How do you deal with that? Don't go. <laughs> Don't go. If you're not going because you're being controlled by the anxiety of what might happen, then it, it actually already got you before you actually ever went. Because it still dictated what you did. You see? So how you deal with your anxiety in both of these situations will reveal your heart. How do you respond when you don't get what you want? or when you get what you don't want. We've talked about that before. You guys generally do a pretty good job, right? When you don't get when you don't get what you want. Or if you really don't want something and then you get it, it causes challenges for all of us. Are you full of fear and anxiety and worry? Do you have trouble sleeping? Do you become obsessed with your problem? Does your mind go over your troubles over and over again? Like your tongue goes over a sore spot in your mouth. You ever had a sore spot in your mouth? Keep going back to it. So when you're anxious, let me hear some, let me hear a few things real quick. When you are anxious, you personally, what's your go-to? When you're worried, stressed out, anxious. Now again, I understand some of you, the Lord. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. Okay, but on the negative side, what do you go to? What's that? Books. Get lost in a book. I think it's stay over here. Okay, so lost in a book. Why are you doing that? So I can forget. So I can forget. Avoiding, right? Sleep. Sleep. Anyone like the sleep factor? Yeah. Yeah. Why do you do it? Be similar. Avoid it. Avoid it. 
you're and you're worn out, like you're just exhausted working instead of you sleep, and you just not have to deal with it. Huh? Miss Wanda, did you put up your hand? Okay, huh? Yes. I'm stressed. Let me find some chocolate. Don't you're getting more and more specific. Peanut M and M's. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, look at that. So we don't we do. I deserve them because I'm hurting right now. And then and then other people go. You deserve these. You're hurting right now. And they're. I mean, they're doing it out of love for you. But it does this reinforce sometimes in our minds some challenging things. Uh, Miss Marcy, did you have one? I was going to say. Okay. Okay. Now again. <laughs> it's still on the chocolate back there. I go to you. That's a, that probably doesn't get you anywhere. But then I don't have to decide what to do. I can just vent to you or dump it on you or um, whatever else. So some of us go to other people, right? And you have your children, right? Well, not if I'm making them my savior. <laughs> All of our responses here give us a window into our heart. They help us see what our hopes, our dreams, our wishes are in our lives. They tell us what we believe we cannot do without. He goes into um, next in this about how to respond. And so I want to look at a few passages before we end tonight on some ways to respond. Um, let's look at Psalm 94, verse 19. Open up to Psalm 94. All right, Psalm 94, the Lord will not forsake his people is the title at least Uh, That's what it has in my translation here. Um, The Lord, kind of summarizing here, the Lord taking out the enemies of Israel. Um, But He doesn't do that in the beginning. The beginning of this is Israel's getting pummeled. They're getting beaten. My enemies are surrounding me type ideas, right? Right? And then the question is, in verse 7, the Lord, does not, the Lord does not see the God of Jacob, does not perceive. It's like God's forgotten me. That's what the psalmist is saying. You've forgotten me. You, maybe you don't, maybe he doesn't see, his eyes aren't seeing, his ears aren't hearing. What is going on, God? And then he goes into discipline <clears throat> as how the Lord teaches us. Verse 14, for the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in the heart will follow it. Okay, so he says, that, "Yes, this will happen for a season, but the Lord doesn't forget you." And then, verse starting in eighteen, or let's go from seventeen. If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, helped held me up. What do you picture when you hear that my foot slips? What just comes in your brain real quick? A cliff. A cliff, doesn't it? At least for me it does. Like somebody's rock climbing and like, I don't know, they're just, their foot slips on the side. And what's he saying? The Lord held, I would have fallen if he didn't hold me there. And then he says, when the cares of my heart are many, your, my translation reads, consolations cheer my soul. What are some other translations on that? Anyone have a different translation? In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Your comforts delight my soul. Good. Others? NIV is uh, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Your consolation brought joy to my, brought soul. Joy to my soul. Any others? When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Is that person saying they were probably stressed and anxious and worrying? <laughs> the cares were, were many, not just like one thing. Many were there. And what is it that helps cheer the soul? Or who is it? Love of, the, of, of, of God? 
steadfastness of God? The Word. The Word? Yeah. Another one, flip, so you can mark that. Flip uh, over to Proverbs. He couldn't make it tonight, but he wanted to encourage us with this one. If he was here, he would have, if you're listening. Hi, Jeff. Jeff, in talking about this, said Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. Some of you know this one. But we didn't, we didn't bring it up, I don't think, as one of the ones we've, we use. But Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and maybe 7, um, and, and 8, <laughs> maybe more. But uh, trust in the Lord, right, with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. What's our role in that? Trust. trust. And then what does God do? Everything else. Everything else. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Repent of any sin going on there, right? Turn away from evil. It will be, look at this, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Another good passage there that's helpful. Heather, did you find your Isaiah passage? Huh? I thought you were going to look. Yeah. Go to 26, Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, beginning in verse 1. Found it. <laughs> Heather, would you read it out loud for us? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Go into the next one, too. It's so good. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Oof. An everlasting rock. Huh. You keep him. So who's doing the keeping there? You keep him. So uh, in perfect peace. So we're the, the him, but the you is God. It's God who's doing the keeping there. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is is stayed on you. Somebody comes up to you and says, I'm, I'm not a Christian, I don't understand the Bible very well. What does it mean that your mind is stayed on God? How do you keep your, I mean, how do you, how do you keep your mind stayed on God? You can memorize. Memorize? Sure. You remember His work. Um, you are in fellowship. Um, pray a lot. Pray a lot. He keeps... He'll keep you in what kind of peace? Perfect peace. If your mind is stayed on him through his word, of course, this is going to be the, what the Spirit uses to, to do this. And so it's part of why we've talked about how this is part of the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, peace. It has to be a work of the Spirit of an overflow. But if your mind is not stayed on him, you're not going to have this perfect peace. It kind of reminds me, Liam just headed out, I think, but any of the kids, I've shared that with you before, whether it was jumping into the pool, climbing down out of a tree, they were doing something, and they're looking at the gap from where they are to the ground or to the water or to whatever it is, and they're, they're worried, and, they will, and they're shaking up in the tree, and I'm right here, and I can almost touch their foot. I'm like, just drop. I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. I've got you, right? <gasps> And they're not looking at me. They're looking at the ground. They're looking at the tree. They're looking all around. They're freaking out. Have you had this before? They're looking everywhere except at me. They might glance at me for a moment, but then they're off again. And it's just like, hey, look at me. Sometimes you got to raise your voice. I feel like the Lord sometimes, Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that hello sometimes stings a little. Look at me. I've got you. And then they still keep looking. I, I would love to say, and then the story goes, they just jump with their arms wide open <laughs> into me. Doesn't work that way either. But what's, I mean, I'm dad. Hopefully I'm going to catch them, but... They may have heard a story once when I didn't catch them. And so they're like, eh, well, you're like nine for ten. I'm not sure I can catch I'm not going to 
God's 10 for 10. He never drops us. He always catches us. But you have to look at him. You have to keep your mind stayed on him or you will not have perfect peace. Very similar to the other, trusting in the Lord. See the theme over and over. Last passage I want to look at was, as Lori pointed out, and you guys mentioned this one. Let's go back into Philippians. Go to the New Testament. I'll go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. All right, so, yeah, we'll do starting in verse 6. He starts off in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, right? Is that where it starts? Okay. I'm going to read some commentary he has here. Do not be anxious about anything. He is not telling you to uh, gird your loins, get a grip, be stoic, or pop a pill. Instead, the passage gives you reasons to not be anxious. God's consolations for his anxious people are right alongside his admonition to deal rightly with your anxiety. Consider how these consolations change how you deal with your anxiety. Going back to verse 5 now. Verse 5. The Lord is near. What's verse 5 say? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He says that just before. What does it mean that the Lord is at hand? He's with you. So part of the reason you're not supposed to be anxious is the fact that the Lord is at hand. The part of the reason my kids shouldn't be anxious is I'm right there. Problem, they forget. Problem, we forget. If you think about your bad anxiety reactions, the unhealthy worry, fretting, and churning, you will notice that you have always forgotten that the Lord is near. When you worry and obsess, you are living as if you just... If, you just, if just you and your struggles are going one-on-one, like in a fight, you're forgetting that it's not a one-on-one. If you remember, in even the worst circumstances, the Lord is near, then you will have a rock on which you can, your heart can rest. You have a hope that is bigger than any threat, even death. You draw near to the Lord who is close. Again, he reminds us that it is the Lord who created all of the universe. Now, in 4.6... Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, and by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be, no, may, be, no, be made known to God. It shows us that he's listening. He's near, and he's always listening. Paul tells us in this passage to make our request known to him. Think about that for a minute. If the Lord is near, if he is someone who knows what's on your heart, who knows what weighs heavily on you and preoccupies you, then he is a hearer of his beloved children. Many psalms start out by pleading with God, Lord, listen to me. Bend your ear. You must hear me. I need you to listen and act on my behalf. These are not calm psalms. They are intense and pointed. What guarantee or how does it help you knowing that he's listening and he hears everything? How does that help you? Okay, that's true. It's a warning to watch what we say. What's that? There's great comfort. There's great comfort. He's not too busy. He didn't miss it. (laughs) Right? Great comfort. What else? Anything different come to mind? I don't ever have to carry it on my own. Because I know he's not sleeping. He's not going to miss it. He doesn't sleep nor slumber, right? We're reminded of that. Right. He's right there. Right when you need him. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. So, this is going to go too deep. Um, so I trust him, but I also know that he doesn't work around me, he works through me. Mm-hmm. He, he works around me as well, but he works primarily when I. If my fear is 
lack of righteousness, making a mistake, mm -hmm. doing the wrong thing, then I know he works through me. Um, so I think one of the attacks, one of the things that gets people is they see themselves fail mm -hmm. in, the, in the righteous category. Just the way they think, and the way they picture things. They say, I'm going to say, I don't do that, I pray. Mm -hmm. And then they lose hope, as opposed to what the psalm says, in Psalm 23, that Mary mentioned, that in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Right. You can trust him to turn that around right. and lead you, yeah. not by your power, by the Spirit's power, mm -hmm. in the right direction. Right. That's so important. Yeah. Otherwise, you're, it's not going to work. Yeah. Because what you're really asking for when you pray, you don't believe that. What you're really asking for is for the Lord to come down and do something about the situation. Mm. And I'm sorry, that's going to sometimes it might. Happen, yeah. But that's not a good prayer. It could be. Yeah, you're wanting. You're wanting. What, what we're trying to get at is the lack of peace that you're having, the anxiety and things that are going on in your heart, and you're asking God to work in you. Not not necessarily just change the situation, although we can pray for that too. But Jesus promised troubles. I mean, <laughs> it's still going to keep coming, so that we know that that's going to be the case. And then the last part here that he has is in this just these couple of verses here in, in verse seven, as you continue on, and the peace of God, which this is what I think what Carrie was quoting here, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. What an interesting phrase! It's the peace of God which we can't even understand because it's not contingent on everything else. Worldly peace is contingent on everything around us. The peace of God is not, so it passes our understanding and will guard your hearts. That peace is what guards your heart from getting worried and anxious and things. So every time you are not, not the red flashing on the dashboard saying, hey, there's a problem here, your kid's sick. That's supposed to wake you up. Uh-oh, uh-oh. What do you do then? Do you respond? Okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the Lord to comfort us through this. I'm going to ask him to heal, but I know if he doesn't, he's still good. I know that he has a plan. You go and you start reinforcing all these truths. You go to others who are praying for you, reinforcing these truths, and begging him to help. And remembering these passages. Now, if half of us in here struggle with this, and the other half struggle with it, some of the time. And we know people all the time are struggling with this. We've got to make use of what God has said. This is how it works. We have to use the scriptures, cry out to God, and ask him to guard our hearts. Guess what? He'll do it. He will do it. He's faithful to do it. He does get into, which is pretty interesting here, God, listen, listen, listen to this. I thought found this kind of intriguing. God taught Paul a secret we all need to know. The secret of contentment. How many of you would describe yourself as being a content person? I can content. Some of you might be. Paul was. It's okay. <laughs> contentment, unlike indifference, is the godly opposite of worrying and obsessing. When you worry, you're trying to hold on to what you might lose or you're grabbing for what you don't have repeat that. When, when you worry, you're trying to hold on to what you might lose or you're grabbing for what you don't have. Indifference means you are trying not to care about what you don't have or might lose. See the difference there? Indifference means you're trying not to care about what you don't have or you might lose, but that's not contentment. Contentment offers a fundamental stability that comes from knowing that the all-powerful Lord of the universe is near. He is listening to your cries and guarding you day by day. Paul learned contentment by depending on this Lord. He said, I can do everything through him who strengthens me or gives me strength. Paul knew that no matter how the circumstances of his life changed, God would be his constant, faithful, loving protector. That's the, the difference. So we don't want to be indifferent. We want to be content. Okay? Practical strategies. He says this. I'm just going to read the bold parts here. Make your requests known to God. These are things that we said, but it's just summarizing. Make your requests known to God. Don't make your requests necessarily known to Billy. 
Make your requests known to God. And it's really good, I would say, in in being honest and just saying, God, I don't even understand this. I don't know how to process this, and I just need help. Just be honest. It's okay. That's what he wants. He knows your heart anyway. (laughs) I think this, or Lord, no, just be honest. I don't know. I don't even know what to do right now. Some of you have gotten news in your life where you just go, I don't even know how to process this, God. Make that known to him. Park, I love the the language here, park your mind on what is true. I like that. Reminds me of the car. Just just kind of park it right here on what's true. Not just think on it, because the problem is I go the other direction too. Park your mind on what is true. Also reject all lies containing the word different. I would be safe if I had a different spouse, a different family, different friends, a different church, different job, different house, different anything. Get away from those statements. Tackle your real problem the right way. What he means, I think what he means is not trying to just go after the fruit of what the problem is, but try to figure out what is at the root of what's going on. A lot of things that what we see are just outworkings of something going on deeper. You love the garden, part of the garden club, which you have to have a membership and it's very (laughs) secure from what I remember. When you guys see weeds, is it the best thing to just take a weed eater and just go right over the top of those real quick? Is that going to be the best way to handle those weeds? Spread it around. That's how, that's how you'll spread it around. You'll spread it around. When you come across with the weed eater, which is the way that I do gardening and things, <laughs> why, now why would I do that? Why would I just take a weed eater over it real quick? Why do I do that? Sometimes you don't have time. Quick fix. I don't have time. It's what's easy. It's always anyway. I don't, I don't want to get my hands dirty, maybe. But all I'm doing is spreading the problem even more. And what ends up coming back anyway? Weeds. Versus either putting something on it that kills the root, although we wouldn't want to hurt our, our ecosystem here. So we want to yank them out by the roots. Don't aim. Don't just go. And... and, and so some of us, well, I'm really, I get, I get angry, I get overwhelmed, I get stressed. So what we then do is we try to take out some of the fruit side. Okay, well, then I need to maybe exercise more. Well, maybe that will help you some, <laughs> but that's not the root of what's going on. Well, if I can just avoid this situation. <laughs> maybe there's wisdom to a degree in that, but wouldn't you rather know what's going on in the heart that's causing this? So practically take time to look at the root. He he has a last section there on medication, and I'll just say this. What he argues there is he's saying that ultimately, with anxiety and anxiety attacks in particular, and he just says, he argues that there may be scenarios, there may be scenarios where medication is needed to get the person kind of level, but they still need to work on the heart issues going on. That's not don't just take medication so then I'm, well, I'm not as anxious anymore. That, you haven't fixed the problem. You're just treating the symptoms. So he would just say, his encouragement there would be, go to the root of the problem, which is very similar. So as we all struggle with anxiety, worry, it's something that we have, we need to follow the, the, this, this wisdom and encourage one another with these things. I have these passages. There's many more, and I'd encourage you guys to think on, you know, some of the other passages people read and things. Those are very helpful. Any last thoughts before we pray? Right. Right. Part of the amazing, and then he's beside us, and in the, as f- certainly with the New Testament for sure, he's in us. Right. <laughs> right. Like that's why I'm with you to the end of the age. 
I'm always with you. This life or the life to come, right? It never leaves. All right, good. Who, uh, who will close us in prayer this evening? Miss Heather? Great. <laughs> She gave me the smile, so she's gonna, she gets to. Yes, you need to pray more. <laughs> Almighty, gracious God, thank you for this time. Thank you that we get to come together as a church family, as a body, and rejoice in your word and who you are, in the ways that you have provided for us to draw near to you in the ways that you draw near to us when we don't even know that we are far from you. Lord, help us now as we walk out these doors, as as we close this study. God, I pray that you would do a major work in our hearts and in our minds. Show us why we are worried, why we are anxious, why we are fearful. Get us to the root of those problems. And Lord, we pray that you would yank out those weeds, painful though it may be, Lord, prune us to look more like our Savior, Jesus, because that is what brings you glory, and it's the glory that you deserve. So, Lord, we we thank you for the work that you have done in us, for the work that you will do in us, for perfecting our faith. And, Lord, we pray that you be with us the rest of the evening and with those who couldn't make it tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.